Hello, welcome back to Charis, and today we are going to be talking about The Overstory by Richard Powers. This came out in 2018, it won the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction and it was shortlisted for the Booker Prize. I bought this like two years ago, it's just been sitting on my shelves, so I'm so glad I finally got around to it. Um, I bought it because I was like, it's about trees, I don't need to know anymore, why wouldn't I want to read a book about trees? Um, but I basically had no extra context going into it whatsoever. The first like third-ish of the book are short story form introductions to our main characters and they all have something to do with trees. I didn't even know to be honest that that was going to be the vibe that we were going to be introduced to them and then they'd all intermingle in the rest of the book. I was entirely satisfied that they were just short stories. They worked very well as short stories. The book could have ended there and I would have really liked it anyway. But the rest of the book is these individual characters journeys towards forest conservancy, particularly the destruction of the last redwoods in the Pacific Northwest, um, and it's also about how they converge around their activism. I wrote one note for this review as I was reading it, and it was just the word sumptuous. It's sort of an epic story um, in that it really skillfully weaves all of these narratives and it creates really intimate portraits of these characters, all of whom are very different, but it also doesn't miss the broader context and also expertly moves through time. Uh, the bulk of the plot I'd say takes place in the 1990s but um, I mean each of the individual short stories starts wherever they were born, possibly a few generations before that, um, and it goes right up until the present day. It also crescendos to drama really well. In that way it sort of reminded me of my favourite book, The Secret History by Donna Tartt, there you are, um, in that you're so kind of caught up in like the writing um, and then suddenly plot starts happening and you're like wow this is really good. <laughs> I don't have anything more to say on like actually what happens in the book or how the writing is because tick let's go on and talk about some more general topics. So trees this book is a love story to trees and ecology and conservancy and activism um, but especially just trees the wondrous beings they are. It went through so many things that I kind of like knew or were taught in school but haven't really wondered over or thought about in years, such as how trees talk to each other and they can support entire ecosystems even after their death. I really want to seriously talk about trees but there's now a group of people going down the street with freaking tambourines. There's also a steel drum player earlier that was playing Wonderwall right outside my house, so at least you missed that. We're gonna power through actually because that kind of vibe is actually the sort of hippie vibe in the book. <laughs> Last week when I wrote the notes for this video, um, I'd just gone on a really, really beautiful walk in Epping Forest and I was just marvelling at these gorgeous chestnut trees. Chestnuts are quite heavily featured in the book and just being like, wow, why, why, don't, why don't I sit and look at trees and think these are amazing more often? And I guess the answer to that is that like, I kind of think of them as either statues in that they're like unmoving and they're just there or I think of them as a commodity to make stuff with. But man, trees are amazing. And I think like it's been a big theme of my last year wanting to be a lot closer to nature. And this definitely like sung in my soul for that. We've had this book that I think my boyfriend was given by someone around the world in 80 trees um, for like a year or so. And it is literally just, I'll pick a random page, just, just talking about individual trees. So, you know, the Areca palm in India uh, and what they do with it. I just, I wish I just knew more. I wish I, I, w I wish I could see trees and know what breed? Species, that's the word. <laughs> this book has really spurred me on to read this book and just become a bit more knowledgeable about trees and be in like natural headspace more than I am in technology headspace. One of the biggest themes in the book is consumption and human hubris really. So we have the industry that's trying to cut down these last redwoods before this policy changes. We also have the, these individual um, tree cutters that are just trying to make a living and there's a huge conflict there and it's a very human conflict that we see um, between these activists and the people that are just trying to get by, you know, they're caught up in this capitalist system as well. I think it's something that we as a society have been reckoning with more um, in recent years about our consumption of goods and how that impacts the world. I think food and clothes for me are very top of mind in terms of my consumption, um, but wood, like, I mean, I just, I buy tons of wood and I'm just, I don't think I've ever actually thought about whether it's sustainably sourced or not, because 
I think like I, if I buy from Ikea, it's going to be shitty and it's going to be thrown away. Um, so that's definitely bad. But if I'm buying like raw materials myself to make stuff in the same way that like sewing your own clothes seems more ethical than feeding into this short termist um, like consumption cycle. Uh, but you still have to get them in the first place, you know, <laughs> like you still have to buy those materials. I've been thinking a lot recently about altruism and individual action and what I can best do, uh, mostly with money, um, to make the world a better place. I've always thought that the climate crisis and environmental issues are very serious, but the way to solve them is through policy rather than charity. But policy is limited by industry and industry is controlled by consumers and can your individual actions in how you change your consumption actually affect the, the broader system? Or is it that researchers that convince the politicians that force the industry, blah, blah, blah. I feel like I'm still quite early on that journey and I would love some book recommendations about that if you've read any particularly good books about um, consumption and about individual action. I would love to read them. Okay, the next thing I have to talk about is plants versus animals. This is gonna get controversial. I am a meat eater, I love me some meat, I'm very aware that that is bad for the environment and I've changed my actions to the extent that I only buy meat from my local butcher and I don't eat meat as often as I used to um, but still haven't like massively changed my life um, to a plant-based diet. Something I've been mulling over for years which has been supercharged by this book is like this sort of division we have between animals and plants and whether that's justifiable. Beyond the environmental reasons for not eating meat, um, it's mostly just because they're animals, they're living beings and they have feelings and therefore it's like murder. But is the same not true for plants? And I think so many people are like, plants grow, but they're not cognitive. And I always think about this episode of Radiolab, the podcast, called Smarty Plants from a few years ago. And it was about, I'll leave a link down below, it was literally about how plants do have memory, like even things that have no like central, um, like cognitive structure, they can preserve the memory of experiences and change their reactions to things based on those. So in the overstory, um, one of the main characters is this researcher, like a tree researcher, and she does loads of work into um, trees as, as ecosystems, as, as, as holistic, they're not individuals, they very much are a community and they are affected by each other. And I love that idea that there's just so much more going on. I'm not gonna use that as an excuse to like <laughs> never be a vegetarian, but it's such an arbitrary divide we have. And I think very often we don't really think of plants as being like really alive, not just things that can wither away or grow, but like are actively, things are happening in them. And I think that's especially hard to do for trees where we think of them as such like a raw material. And I can't, I can't picture, I just don't, I just don't understand how there is knowledge in there. When you cut it down, it is just becomes bookshelves. Like how is there knowledge preserved in the thing? It is wondrous and wonderful. And I think there's gonna be a big shift in that as well over the next few decades. We're going to start appreciating a lot more of the world around us as having the answers way before we try to invent them. Now one slightly cynical note, I want to talk about the impact of this book because I left the book very much with a love of trees but not particularly charged for activism in the same way that characters in this book are, like that's a lot of the plot. And I think that's a consequence of um, this book being very much stretched over time. So it's extremely environmental, it's extremely prescient, but it is sort of written as an evergreen book. Although it's dealing with issues that are quite um, contemporary and a lot of people want to read more about at the moment, I think it's been particularly written as to be more of a perennial read, possibly even to toe the line on, is it a fad book for the old awards? But I think that's kind of a shame because it does have the power to, to charge people up for um, activism, but doesn't actually leave you with that. I really loved it as a book and thought it was really well written, but I don't know, that just seemed like a bit of a cop out for me that you're reading a book about environmentalism and about activism and, um, and you can feel really good while you're reading it, like, oh yeah, I care about the environment as well. And then you finish it and you enjoy it as like the memory of having read a book rather than putting into action the things that it's supposed to be promoting. Just something that I've come away from it with um, that I thought would be worth mentioning.
So this has been a video on the book The Overstory by Richard Powers. I'm sorry for my terribly loud street below, but I hope you've enjoyed um, us talking about it. If you've read the book, let me know what you thought about it. And if you haven't, um, go, go and pick it up. It's very long. It is very long, but it's joyful throughout. Thanks a lot for watching. I'll catch you in the next one.